Welcome to the final episode, episode 26 of my 2022 training diaries. This week, I'm gonna do something a little different instead of telling you about my training because really I'm mostly still just in recovery mode after UTMB. I'm gonna pull back the curtain and show you how it is that I make these videos. I'll talk about everything from scripting to my production set here to editing. I'll try not to get too technical though, because my hope is that even if you have no interest in filmmaking, that you'll still find this video somewhat interesting. Then I'll talk about the lessons that I've learned in making this series, because this was really the first time that I've attempted to publish this regularly for this long. And finally, I'll talk about what my plans are for next year around another possible season of the series. So let's start with the scripting process. Throughout the season, I've been collecting ideas kind of as I go for future episodes. I use a program called Evernote to collect my ideas for this and really for everything in my life. Having a good place to capture and to organize your ideas is part of the GTD methodology or getting things done based on the book by the same name written by David Allen. If you know what I'm talking about, then we probably have a lot in common. Now, I didn't totally plan out the entire season of videos, but there were some key events that I could plan around, like some of my races and traveling, for example. I knew that I'd be doing a recap video the week after each race, and also where it would make the most sense to talk about things like tapering or recovery. I could then sort of pull from my bank of ideas on the other weeks, trying to tie in the various themes that I was hoping to cover wherever it made the most sense with what I was doing at the time. I'd also been negotiating with a couple of different sponsors throughout this season that you've come to know. So these contracts I actually negotiated way in advance and then I was able to plan the integrations around some of those themes for the upcoming videos. So I'd been planning, for example, since this spring to feature Surfshark VPN while we were traveling in Europe because I knew we'd be using a VPN there like I always do when I travel. And so it would be a much more natural segue to mention it then than at any other time in the year. And same with Athletic Greens. I tried to plan this around different themes that I was hoping to talk about, like nutrition or travel. And I'd usually sit down to write my scripts a day or two before filming, but sometimes just the day of. And some were pretty straightforward and only took an hour or so, and then others took a lot more research and time. Now I conducted sort of an informal poll on last week's video, where I asked you guys to guess whether or not I use a teleprompter. And first of all, thank you so much for all of the kind words that came along with those guesses. You guys are way too kind. And so the results were 12 for yes and 24 for no. And that tells me one thing, that I've gotten pretty good at reading from one of these things. So yes, I do use a teleprompter for every single one of these videos and for all of the review videos on my channel. I even brought my prompter with me to Europe so that I could use it there for these weekly videos as well. Unfortunately, the one that I use is quite small and portable, and it uses an iPad mini. And the way that this works is pretty cool. There's a piece of glass at a 45 degree angle directly in front of the lens, which is reflective on one side, the side that I'm looking at. So it can reflect an image of the iPad where the text is being displayed. And then I can in turn control the speed of the text with my iPhone, which I keep directly in front of me here on a stool. But the other side of the glass is completely transparent, so it gives the illusion that I'm still looking directly into camera at you guys, even though I'm actually reading the text that's being displayed here in front of it. So when it comes to my training diary series, every word you're hearing me say, even what I'm saying right now, is scripted. And I do that for a few reasons. And the first really is just that I value your time. I want my communication to be as clear and as concise as possible. I don't want to be fumbling for my words or adding in unnecessary ums and ahs. And I think this also results in videos that are much more engaging as well. I'm a video producer by trade and I've done a lot of work as a video marketing strategist. So I'm no stranger to things like analytics and I pay pretty close attention to where my viewers tend to drop off in a video and which parts tend to get the most engagement. The second reason is that I actually just find it much faster to record when I'm reading from a teleprompter. I'm less likely to forget things or to make mistakes, so I can usually bang these things out pretty quickly now in really just a single take. I might do a second take just for safety in case there's a problem with the audio or something like that, but the key here is that I write it in my own words to begin with and in the same way that I speak. And this is important to making it sound natural as well, which is something that I learned years ago when working with clients. 
But ultimately, some of my videos, I'm trying to communicate some fairly complicated ideas and really just a lot of information. I'm a pretty analytical and introverted person, so I perform much better when I have time to really consider what it is that I want to say in advance. So scripting it word for word like this just works better for me. So I use my teleprompter for all of my product review videos, as I said. The only exception really is for my documentaries where I'm on location and where it's less about you know, communicating a bunch of information. Although in those cases, I still often script and plan at least roughly what I'm gonna say in advance, even for during my races. If you wanna learn more about my process for making my films, be sure to check out the Making of Racing Namibia video that I published a few months ago, which goes into detail on how I produced that entire series. Now it's taken me a lot of practice to get comfortable enough in reading from a prompter to trick apparently two thirds of you like I did. In fact, I've improved a lot just through the course of this series. If you go back to episode one, I think you'll see what I mean. But I've been using a prompter fairly regularly in my professional work for years, and I've directed countless people on camera, both amateurs and professional actors. And there are a few tricks that I use, like keeping the text nice and small and centered in the screen to minimize how much my eyes are moving back and forth like this. And you'll probably notice that I add in some pauses here and there, and I look off screen sometimes to give you the impression that I'm kind of thinking about what I'm saying instead of just reacting to what I'm reading. Now, another thing that helps me to speed up my production process is to use a consistent setup here in my living room. Now, ideally, I would just leave all of this stuff set up all the time, but unfortunately, I do have to tear it down and set it up every time. But placing the camera here in the exact same spot and using the exact same lighting setup does save me a lot of time because these are just creative decisions that I don't need to make every single week. Earlier on in the series, I experimented with a few different setups before landing on this one. And of course, when I'm traveling, my setup is completely different and I'm, I'm not bringing any of these big lights with me, but I thought I'd show you now what I've got going on for my standard living room setup. So beside my camera here is my primary light, what you'd call a key light, which I keep pretty low. I then use a secondary light over there on the stove, which I bounce off the ceiling to bring up the overall ambient lighting in the room. I then place a small light on a stand directly behind me here to create some separation. This is what you'd call a backlight. I like my lighting in a scene to feel like it's motivated. So this implies that the light is coming from behind me from that window and it's adding that rim of light that you can see here on my arms. And the last light that I use is just a small one that I place in that lamp there at the back of the room. And this is a pretty common trick used on film sets where pretty much any lamp that you're seeing in the background of a shot, what we'd call a practical light, you can pretty much bet that they've actually replaced the bulb or are shining a different light from above altogether to give the appearance that that lamp is actually being used. And one reason can be that some bulbs flicker if they're not operating at the exact same frequency as the camera, which is particularly a problem with cheaper fluorescent bulbs. But more often than not, it's because the color temperature is wrong. All of these other lights that I've used here are daylight temperature, which is quite blue by comparison, whereas the bulb in this lamp back there is incandescent, so it's a much warmer looking bulb, which would look just horrible on camera, plus it's way too bright. So by using this little light back there, I can not only dial in the color temperature, but I can also dial the intensity way down so that it's not too bright and is more in balance with the overall scene. It might seem crazy that I'm paying this much attention to a small detail like this, but honestly, I've been lighting sets for so many years that this kind of stuff just comes naturally, and it would totally bug me if I wasn't to do it. And as I mentioned, now that I've got this set kind of designed, it really only takes me about five minutes to set it up each week anyway. The camera itself is a fairly cheap Sony APS-C mirrorless camera, the A6600, but I use a fairly good prime 16mm lens with a very large aperture, and that's what keeps me so sharp while making the background look so blurry. And that's again just fundamental camera theory that you learn as a videographer. And I shoot in a flat color profile, a custom one that I've designed so that I can then grade my footage in post-production. For audio, I use a wireless lapel or lavalier mic. And sometimes you'll see this clipped on to the top of my shirt here when I'm feeling lazy or in a hurry, but other times like today, I'll actually tape this under my shirt here, which is pretty common practice, again, on film sets. But this can lead to a bit of rustling if your shirt moves. So a trick that I learned from a professional sound person years ago is that you actually wanna tape the mic not to your skin, but to the thing that's going to cause the rustling. So in this case, I actually tape the mic to the inside of my shirt itself. So a little pro tip for all you other videographers out there. And I'll include links to all of this gear in the description in case you wanna nerd out and learn more. 
So once I'm done shooting, which again, I can usually get done in about 25 minutes or so, I then copy my footage to my computer and make a backup before importing it all into DaVinci Resolve, where I do all of my editing and color correction. Now, I usually have got to jump on editing my B-roll in advance. This is something that I'll do kind of as I go throughout the week. I tend to shoot for the edit, meaning that when capturing footage, say during a Wednesday speed work session, I kind of know that I'm looking to edit a scene of maybe 45 seconds or so in length and roughly what my sequence of shots will be. So when I get home, I might transfer my card and just quickly cut this together while it's fresh in my mind. And this way, when I sit down on Monday or Tuesday to edit the scripted stuff, I've got these scenes kind of just ready to pop in. I then have to find music, and I use a website for this where I'll occasionally go and will pre-select a bunch of tracks that I like so that when I need something, I can just quickly go and find one that will work from my existing collection. I also do a fair bit of work on the audio, depending on the footage. Sometimes it's way too windy, so I'll actually add back in the sounds of birds and water and footsteps and things. I do more of this kind of work on my films, but I try to keep it simple on these weekly updates. The next step is color correction, and I do have some presets, or what we call LUTs, that I use to start with, and then I have a fairly standardized workflow involving a series of what are called nodes in DaVinci Resolve. So I've got this fairly streamlined, and I'm fortunate to own a hardware control panel that speeds up the process a little bit as well. But color correction is a really important part of the creative process for me. I'm planning on making a video as soon as I have time, which talks more about how to shoot and color correct GoPro footage in particular. And I'm considering actually providing that custom LUT that I've created as well, in case anybody wants to download that and achieve a similar look to their footage. So stay tuned for that. The graphics I try to keep simple. In fact, the most time consuming part is to create that Strava snapshot that I show most weeks. I'm not sure if any of you noticed, but I edit this a fair bit in Photoshop because I want to be able to show both elevation and distance on a single screen, and I want to remove all the other non-essential elements that might be distracting. But the rest of the graphics are mostly just lower thirds to show locations and distances and things like that, which are pretty much just copy and paste. I then upload the video privately to YouTube so that I can first preview it in 4K on my television back there before making any final tweaks. It's usually just things around audio levels or maybe a typo that I might have missed before then setting it up to publish to the public. And of course, this also means creating a thumbnail image, which honestly is my least favorite part of the entire process. I'm sure other creators can relate to why that is. Here you've created this video that you're really proud of, but ultimately how compelling your thumbnail image is could determine how many people actually end up watching it. And the title is actually something that I planned during the scripting phase. So then it's just a matter of writing the description and adding tags. But the closed captions are something that take me quite a bit of time because I manually create these to make sure that they're as accurate as possible. Fortunately though, since I am scripting these videos word for word, it's really just any audio from my B-roll footage that needs to be transcribed. But according to my analytics, roughly 24% of my viewers watch my videos with the captions turned on. So this tells me that many of you are either watching with the sound low or turned off, maybe on the treadmill, or potentially for many of you, English is a second language. So I definitely try to invest time in these, but it's something that I did fall behind on for a few weeks while I was traveling this summer, so my apologies for that. To be honest, when I started this series, I wasn't really sure how long I'd be able to keep it up. So I'm a little surprised that I made it this far. But this definitely was a very useful exercise for me, and I learned a few things along the way. As I like to say, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. And this is definitely true when it comes to video projects like this. And I think I underestimated just how much work this series would be, and in turn, how much time and energy it would take up. And unfortunately, that just meant that some of my other bigger and more important projects have taken a back seat, because every hour that I spend on this series is an hour that I'm not spending on editing, say, my series from Georgia back in June. But I think there is something to be said for the exercise of giving yourself a consistent deadline, like having to publish once a week like this. Always remember what Stephen King said in his memoir called On Writing, where he talked about how he became such a productive and prolific author. And it really was about setting a goal for himself of sitting down every morning to write 10 pages, no matter what. They didn't have to be great. It was more about the practice of consistently putting pen to paper. Seth Godin talks a lot about this as well. 
the idea of consistently shipping your work and not getting held up trying to make it perfect. And with that consistency comes the opportunity to fail faster and to iterate more rapidly. I think I improved some very specific skills this season when it comes to things like shooting with a 360 camera, for example. I was using it on a weekly basis and then immediately editing it to see the results and then applying what I learned the following week. So when it came time to use it on a big project, like my recent race at UTMB, the stakes were much lower because I'd really mastered it by that point. And the same thing really goes for my overall production workflow. By forcing myself to look for these efficiencies, I've learned to be more productive and efficient for the long term. So for anyone who wants to become more productive with their own craft, I challenge you to think of your own goal that you can set, something that requires you to consistently put your work out into the world. That's the key part. This could be something that you try to do daily or weekly or monthly for a few weeks or a few months. And the key here, I think, is to have somebody to hold you accountable. I have all of you who came to expect a weekly video. And so when I'm late or I'm thinking about skipping a week, I feel like I'm gonna let you all down. And that was the key to my consistency. But I also think there needs to be an end point. You need a finish line. And for me, that was always gonna be once my season officially came to an end, as it has. So what's next? Well, actually I haven't decided yet, mostly because I still haven't set any goals for next year. I may end up doing just another season of weekly training diaries like I did this year, although in that case I'd wanna iterate in some way in terms of my creative approach. But I think the key to a regular series like this is having a somewhat standardized format because otherwise there's just way too many creative decisions to be making on a regular basis, which takes way too much time. Whatever I do though, I'd likely aim for a shorter series, likely around 16 episodes maybe instead of 26, just to give myself a bit more time for other projects. But let me know what you guys think. Would you rather see more content like this series or would you prefer that I focus my limited time and energy on my longer race and adventure films, knowing that it's sometimes hard to balance both? My season is over when it comes to my goal races, but I am actually planning on running one more race just for fun. It's called the Epic Azores, the first week of December, on the Azores Islands, which are in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It looks like a beautiful location, and I was fortunate to have been invited by the race organizers to join them this year. So I'll try to come back to you guys a couple of times this fall to tell you more about that race and to just let you know how my training is coming along as I try to get at least a little bit of running volume back in my legs. But in the meantime, I've got an overwhelming amount of editing to do, so I better get back to work here. And a reminder that we'll be launching a weekly newsletter soon, where we'll be highlighting all of these new films as they're released, along with links to other resources and to online discounts and more. So be sure to sign up in the link below so that you start getting that as soon as we start publishing it, likely in the next week or two. So I hope you found that interesting and I hope that you enjoyed this entire series. It was a super rewarding project for me and the feedback has been just so consistently positive. So thank you all for coming along for the ride. As always, give this video a like and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already because I've got a lot of really fun content coming your way.